The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Veronica LeBeau. I'm the Executive Director for the Northern California Division of the American Liver Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Ask the Expert series webinar. This presentation is Autoimmune Hepatitis and PSC. Our vision is a world without liver disease. And as a part of our 2019 educational outreach, we want to thank Drs. Marion Peters, Kiddis Yamam, and Chris Bolas for sharing their expertise, and to all of you for joining us. We would also like to thank UCSF, UC Davis, and California Pacific Medical Center for their support as well. Before I turn this over, to our esteemed speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping points. Please mute your device to minimize background noise. You can type your questions in the chat section at any time during our presentation. We're going to hold off answering those questions until after the speakers finish. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our national ALF website and our Northern California website under resources and then click on webinars. You can also find those links and many other resources listed on the last page of this webinar. Thank you so much for attending our first 2019 webinar and I am honored to introduce our moderator, Dr. Marion Peters. Thank you very much, Veronica. It's a pleasure to talk to you tonight. We're going to start off with Dr. Kiddis Yamam, who's the Director of Autoimmune Liver Diseases, California Pacific Medical Center. And she's going to give an overview of autoimmune hepatitis diagnosis and treatment. All of these talks could be an hour long on their own. So we've really tried to pick what we thought was most important for you, the, the attendees, but we'll have at least half an hour at the end to answer questions if we have not brought up your favorite topic. And then primary sclerosis and cholangitis, Dr. Christopher Bolas from University of California, Davis, will talk about diagnosis and treatment. And then I will finish with a short presentation of autoimmune hepatitis and pregnancy and I'm at the University of California, San Francisco. So the next slide is Dr. Yimam, who will now give her presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us um, on today's webinar. I will be covering diagnosis um, and treatment of autoimmune hepatitis. I will start with reviewing some of the key questions that come up in clinic, which include what is autoimmune hepatitis, what causes autoimmune hepatitis, and who's at risk, how do we diagnose autoimmune hepatitis, is a liver biopsy needed, how do we treat autoimmune hepatitis, uh, what are the type of medications used to treat autoimmune hepatitis, and for how long do these medications uh, need to be taken, when is a liver biopsy, I'm sorry, a liver transplant needed for patients in autoimmune hepatitis? Um, I will go through these questions through the presentation. So the first question, what is autoimmune hepatitis? Autoimmune hepatitis is a relatively rare chronic inflammatory disease of the liver that is characterized by uh, circulating autoantibodies as well as elevated serum globulin level. It has a very variable clinical presentation, which includes um, from patients presenting with just asymptomatic elevation in liver enzymes to rare presentation of patients with acute liver failure. In terms of what, cause, what causes autoimmune hepatitis, this working model for the cause or the pathogenesis postulates that there is often an underlying genetic predisposition 
um, in an environmental trigger, which could be viral infection, drug, or sometimes unknown cause, setting off uh, this inflammatory cascade um, coupled with failure of the immune system from differentiate self from others will lead to uh, T cell mediated immune attack upon the liver um, that will progress, uh, that would lead to progressive inflammation, fibrosis um, in advanced liver disease over time, if not treated. Who is at risk of autoimmune hepatitis? Autoimmune hepatitis is common in women, uh, than made with a ratio of 3.6 to 1. It is often seen in all ethnic groups and also at all ages. It has variable incidence and prevalence worldwide. And data from European studies showed that the incidence of autoimmune hepatitis ranged from 0.9 to 2 per 100,000 population per year um, with a prevalence of 11 to 25 cases per 100,000 uh, population in the incidence and those main women, main in women, seems to be rising. Um, unfortunately, so far we don't have a great population-based studies to report good um, uh, numbers to indicate incidence and prevalence um, in the U.S., but hopefully that data will be forthcoming. The next question is how do we make a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis? It is based on a very careful history um, with exclusion of other diseases, uh, coupled with specific clinical and biochemical features that are specific to autoimmune hepatitis, which I will review on the next slide. Patients with autoimmune hepatitis have, again, variable uh, presentations, uh, variable symptoms at presentation, which include asymptomatic to debilitating symptoms of fatigue, weight loss, uh, joint aches, and their physical examination can range from normal exam findings to exams suggesting a very advanced liver disease or liver failure, which could include jaundice, ascites, or enlarged spleen. Um, since it has such a variable presentation, it should definitely be excluded in, or should be included in the differential diagnosis of patients with any degree of abnormality in liver biochemistry. Some of the clinical features of autoimmune hepatitis, again, include um, predominant, predominantly elevated ASD and ALT in their liver enzyme on their liver uh, biochemistry testing. Patients often have, again, elevated serum globulin or IgG. They have autoantibody positivities for antinuclear antibody, anti-smooth method, which is also known as anti-actin antibody, anti-LKM, anti-liver cytosolic soluble liver antigen or liver pancreas antigen um, autoantibody positivities. On liver biopsy, patients have interface hepatitis, particularly with plasmacytic infiltrate, and they tend to respond they seem to show response to immunosuppressive therapies. Patients with autoimmune hepatitis um, have autoimmune or immune-mediated diseases, um, and 20% 20 20 will have concomitant other autoimmune or immune-mediated diseases in self, and they also tend to have first-degree relatives that are affected with other autoimmune conditions in about 40% of the time. And the most common other Comorbid autoimmune conditions in patients with autoimmune hepatitis include autoimmune thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, ulcerative colitis, as well as celiac disease. Um, in terms of diagnostic criteria, the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Study Group has initially proposed and published diagnostic criteria in 1999, which was later simplified and published in 2008. This criteria has a different scoring system. Points are given uh, based on 
the significance of these different variables in making the, the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. And we add up all those points, and if the whole health point is above six, uh, we can make a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis as probable, but if greater than or equal to seven, the diagnosis would be definite. This variable, so again, include ANA or antiactin antipositivity at a low titer E1 point. Um, if we have a higher titer or if we have other more specific autoantibody positivities, we can get up to two points. Um, level of IgG in the serum, um, again, depending on the level, if we have a higher level of IgG, we give more points. And most importantly, liver biopsy would be needed as uh, it is really important that uh, we have compatible findings or typical finds, uh, findings of autoimmune hepatitis or liver histology to make the diagnosis uh, and, and confidence it's also important that we exclude other liver diseases, particularly viral hepatitis, um, and that will uh, give us additional two points. Again, if the total score is above uh, six, probable, greater than or equal to seven, um, we will be able to make the diagnosis more definitely. Next slide. Um, Again, as I stated earlier, liver biopsy would be needed. Um, in addition to being one of the key criteria, I think the liver biopsy would be helpful in assessing the degree of uh, inflammation or the degree of the autoimmune hepatitis activity, and also stage the degree of fibrosis, which are two important factors that we take into account in uh, determining who should be initiated on immunosuppression. Based on autoantibody profiles, patients are generally categorized as type one or type type categorized as having type one or type two autoimmune hepatitis. There is however, a very subgroup of patients that actually do not have uh, autoantibody positivity roughly in 20% of the cohort. And type one autoimmune hepatitis is the most common of the two. Um, it affects about 90% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. This group has anti-actin, ANA, anti-actin antibody positivity in about 70%, 75% of the time, um, and could have anti-SLA or LP antibody positivity in 30% of the time. Um, this group can have uh, onset at any age. Um, they tend to have good response to steroid about 80% of the time with variable risk of relapse um, when drug is discontinued in roughly 75% of the group. Type 2 autoimmune hepatitis is the least common of the two. It affects about 10% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. This group tends to have anti-LKM antibody positivity in about 66% uh, percent of the group. Usually, uh, this is the group that is uh, type 2 autoimmune hepatitis tend to affect children or, or young adults. Compared to um, type 1, the type 2 autoimmune hepatitis group uh, presents more frequently with acute liver failure and about 25% of the time versus 3% in type 1. And they have, um, they present with less frequently in cirrhosis. Um, they tend to have frequent failure of treatment and they have high risk of relapse. This is the group that will definitely need long-term immunosuppressive therapy. How do we treat autoimmune hepatitis? Again, treatment is strongly recommended for those that have advanced fibrosis. Um, however, it's important to exclude patients that have what we call burned out cirrhosis or uh, end stage liver disease with significant liver decompensation since immunosuppression in this group has more risk than benefit. Uh, that, that group should be referred for liver transplant evaluation instead of uh, being immunosuppressed. 
And those treatment is also strongly recommended for those that have moderate to severe autoimmune hepatitis, which is characterized by uh, significantly elevated ASD and ALT, as well as necroinflammation on the liver biopsy. This group tends to also have a higher level of serum IgG. Treatment can be optional, however, for those that have mild diseases, meaning uh, lower level, levels of ALT and IgG, uh, with no um, significant or advanced fibrosis on the initial liver biopsy. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, treatment decision is really individualized. We definitely have to take um, age comorbidities in patients' uh, preference uh, and factor in making the decision. If no treatment is determined, however, it's important to monitor patients closely. Uh, the frequency can be variable, again, depending on our concern for, uh, for activity. But we should monitor liver enzymes as well as IgG closely. The initial treatment goal for autoimmune hepatitis is, is certainly induction of remission, meaning achieving, being able to achieve uh, normal liver enzymes. Uh, we usually start with prednisone at a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram per day. We can go up to 60 milligrams per day. Uh, above that, the benefit is not uh, shown. However, patients that are presenting with acute liver failure with severe hepatitis, that group may benefit from a higher low, uh, dose of prednisone up to 100 milligram uh, per day. However, if there is no response within seven days, um, this group should be considered for liver transplant evaluation immediately as response rate, even using higher doses of prednisone in this group is about 20%. In milder diseases, however, we can start at a lower dose uh, if we've decided to embark on treatment. We can also add azathioprine in combination with prednisone, particularly after we've lowered the bilirubin um, uh, roughly around less than six milligrams per, kilo, uh, per deciliter. Uh, the dose of azathioprine, though, we can start at a lower dose, can be increased based on uh, toxicity as well as response rate. The usual maintenance dose is roughly 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, 6-MT, which is the metabolite of azathioprine, can be used uh, instead of uh, azathioprine. However, if we are using 6-MT, which is 6 mercaps of purine, uh, we usually start at a lower dose of uh, 0.5 to uh, 1.5 milligram uh, per day. The desamide, which is um, a steroid that has a high rate of metabolism through the liver um, and has less systemic exposure, as a result, uh, it leads to fewer steroid-related side effects, uh, can be used in combination with azathioprine and uh, being able to induce remission in autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, Bedesonide is often considered uh, for patients that are not cirrhotic, um, since in those with cirrhosis and portal hypertension, we've seen cases of portal vein thrombosis as well as significantly elevated drug level due to quote unquote um, shunting uh, that is often seen in portal hypertension. We should also consider bedesonide for a specific patient population, particularly young patients um, with acne, as prednisone can um, cause acne. Those with poorly controlled diabetes as well as obesity, since prednisone can worsen diabetes and leads to uh, weight gain. Those with osteoporosis as well as oste osteopenia, and those with uncontrolled psychiatric disorder, as uh, prednisone can actually worsen these psychiatric um, illnesses. Um, we can also consider bedesonide for those patients uh, that do not have severe extrahepatic symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis. Um, some patients have um, significant extrahepatic symptoms that may need uh, systemic uh, exposure of uh, prednisone to treat those symptoms. 
Uh, the second goal, the treatment goal of autoimmunab type is just to maintain uh, this uh, biochemical under remission. Ideally, we want to be able to use a steroid uh, free agent. Is that type of monotherapy would be preferred? Um, if patients can't tolerate azathioprine, however, uh, we can consider a low-dose pertnazone, um, or we can also use a low-dose uh, bidesonide to maintain the remission. How do we monitor patients during treatment? Um, this is also, again, very individualized, but uh, we usually check complete blood count, liver enzymes, INR, which is the international um, uh, ratio, uh, which uh, correlates with liver uh, synthetic dysfunction. Um, initially, perhaps every one to two weeks, um, the frequency, however, can be stretched um, as we taper the prednisone, um, since um, changes of medications are not made frequently as, um, as time um, goes by. Um, Next slide. Um, during maintenance um, of phase, however, again, the frequency of labs can be stretched to every three months with clinic visits every six months. Um, we do have rare patients that have been very stable on, uh, per se, is a type of mono, mono, uh, therapy and labs can be uh, monitored every six months with yearly clinic visits um, in those uh, groups. Again, monitoring of of uh, patients during treatment, during maintenance phase uh, can be very variable and very individualized. Um, the other question that patients usually have is, when can I stop treatment? Can we stop um, treatment um, once it has been initiated? Unfortunately, um, we are only able to achieve withdrawal of treatment in um, only uh, roughly 20% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. It can be considered for selective patients that have been on immunosuppression for at least three years and have had normal liver enzymes um, for at least two years with normalized uh, ASD ALT as well as normalized IgG. Prior to withdrawing treatment, however, it's generally recommended that we get a liver biopsy. Um, and confirm that we have histologic remission, meaning no inflammation on the liver. Um, even in that group, it has been reported that uh, relapse of autoimmune hepatitis can be roughly 60% um, if we end up withdrawing treatment. Um, if uh, withdrawing of treatment is considered, again, it's often done um, in a gradual manner. Um, and in that group of patients, we have to monitor closely. Um, um, we have to monitor them with frequent labs closely as uh, relapse is uh, very common in the first six to 12 months of withdrawing uh, therapy. Patients who ended up having a relapse during drug withdrawal, however, should be kept on immunosuppression long term since they may have increased the risk of relapse and we also need to avoid frequent flares, that's, that's um, a risk factor for um, progressive liver injury. Since liver biopsy is very invasive, um, some patients are very reluctant to give frequent liver biopsies. Um, and if we are not able to perform a liver biopsy before embarking on uh, immunosuppression withdrawal, a study has suggested that we should try to select patients that have ALT less than 50 times the, uh, less than 50% of the upper limit of normal with IgG less than 1200. What are the available treatment options for, that ha for those that are difficult to treat, meaning um, those that do not respond well to the standard treatment regimens that I just presented? Um, we need to make sure that patients are taking their medications. Um, 
compliance is the key. We have to make sure that we have the right diagnosis. As autoantibody positivities have been reported in other diseases, such as fatty liver disease or hep C, it's also important that we review the liver biopsy in a multidisciplinary fashion by involving our pathologist to make sure that we have findings that are typical or consistent of autoimmune hepatitis. If there is any doubt or question, it's also important that we do a, liver, a repeat liver biopsy to have a firm diagnosis in the state of um, continuing immunosuppression without confidence. Um, in terms of uh, what to do for that are not uh, responders to standard treatment regimen, um, we can increase the is that higher prime, um, I'm sorry, we, sh we can measure 6TG level, which is the active metabolite of is that higher prime um, in M4, uh, 235 to 400 level. Uh, this is based on data uh, from patients with inflammatory bowel disease that are treated with is that higher prime. Um, therefore, we can increase the dose of um, azathioprine if needed. We can also increase the prednisone um, to a higher dose and perhaps keep it a bit longer. We can also optimize the azathioprine dose to two milligrams per kilogram per day if, it, if otherwise is tolerated. If, people, if patients have ongoing non-response uh, uh, non status, we can consider alternate immunosuppressive therapies. These are based on, again, a small retrospective um, data, not well studied. Uh, the most commonly used alternate therapy is mycophenolate, which is also known as CELSEPT. Um, response rates have been, um, the re reported response rate uh, ranged from 45 to about 88%. Prograft or cyclorhymus, cyclosporin. Um, other immunosuppressives, um, including rituximab and infliximab, are not generally recommended unless it is uh, an, an extreme case, um, since there is, again, very limited data and there are increased risk of infections with this immunos immunosuppressives. If there is a clinical trial option, it's also uh, we can also consider um, that if that is available. For severe autoimmune hepatitis patients, however, as I stated earlier, um, that group should be referred for liver transplant evaluation. What is the overall prognosis of patients with autoimmune hepatitis once they are on treatment? About 90% of patients actually respond well within two weeks of initiation, ter initiation of therapy with decreased liver enzymes as well as improved symptoms, uh, which is a good news. In the majority of these patients, uh, liver enzymes uh, will normalize um, generally by MENS-12. Once we've achieved the remission, about 50 to 90% will relapse if we end up withdrawing treatment, as, as I stated earlier. If this group is retreated, we are able to achieve uh, clinical remission about um, an 80% of the, the group. Um, clinical laboratory and histology parameters improve but fail to normalize, um, and about 13 patients, patients of 13 uh, percent of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. These are uh, called patients with incomplete um, response. Um, those, there are a subgroup of patients that actually may worsen despite having optimal therapy. And this group is uh, uh, referred as treatment failure. And um, 10 percent of patients with autoimmune hepatitis may fall in that category. Um, in terms of risk of cirrhosis, uh, up to 30 patients of adult, 30% um, of adult patients with autoimmune hepatitis, and up to half pediatric patients um, actually present with cirrhosis at diagnosis. Um, and additionally, 
um, 30 to 50 percent of patients with autoimmune hepatitis will end up progressing to cirrhosis over time. Patients who suffer from who suffer from multiple relapses are at increased risk of cirrhosis compared with patients that are actually maintained in the remission. Um, therefore, it's really important that we keep our patients in clinical remission. And who will need liver transplantation? Liver transplant may be required uh, for those that are presenting again with fulminant or acute liver failure, not responding to high dose of steroid. Those uh, with decompensated cirrhosis, and those patients with cirrhosis complicated by hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and hepatocellular carcinoma is a risk in everyone, every patient with cirrhosis. Ultimately, overall, 10 to 20% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis may end up requiring liver, trans liver transplantation. Um, unfortunately, autoimmune hepatitis does reoccur after liver transplant. And the reported rates range from 8 to 12% at year one to 40 to 60% at year five after liver transplantation. So in summary, um, we need to rule out autoimmune hepatitis in every patient presenting with abnormal liver biochemistry. About 80% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis will need long-term immunosuppression. It is very important that we educate our patients about treatment goals early on. Immunosuppression management is very personalized um, and it will need a close follow-up and good rapport and relationships with our patients. There is, however, very limited data, but emerging um, immunosuppressive, there is limited but emerging data on alternative immunosuppressives that can be used in patients with refractory or non-responding autoimmune hepatitis. In gen uh, overall, there is enormous effort, which is currently an underway by the International Autoimmune Study Group to address many of the unknown questions that we currently have in the management of autoimmune hepatitis. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Yimam, for an excellent talk. And now we'll hand it over to Dr. Bolas. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, having me here today to talk to you about uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC. What I'm going to be talking about is really the diagnosis and touching on the management, but unlike autoimmune hepatitis, we don't have any proven effective therapies for PSC, um, but I'll touch on some of the issues with management as well as some options for treatment. So first of all, diagnosis, like in autoimmune hepatitis, there's not a single blood test we can do to make a diagnosis of PSC. And probably the most important uh, diagnosis that we're trying to differentiate PSC from is PBC, or primary biliary cholangitis. As you can see by the names, there's not a lot of difference, uh, particularly in the acronyms we use, so it's easy to get confused between the two. And that's true both for patients as well as um, physicians who may not see these diseases very frequently because both of them are rare. Just to go over the names, which give us a hint of what the diseases uh, are, they both start with the word primary. And really what we mean by that is that these diseases are not a result of some secondary or other disease leading to injury to the bile ducts or this cholangitis. And they both are cholangitis, and that's just a generic term, meaning there's inflammation of the bile ducts. So the real difference between these diseases are the bile ducts that are affected. And primary biliary cholangitis, or PBC, it affects the very small bile ducts, um, and it's an autoimmune attack of those small bile ducts that results in the disease uh, and destruction of those bile ducts. Whereas in PSC, 
Uh, the S stands for sclerosing, and in medical jargon, this means a stiffening or thickening of the tissue. And so this stiffening or fibrosis or thickening of the tissue occurs in the large bile ducts, and what really differentiates this disease from uh, PBC. Next slide. So some of the other uh, things that differentiate PSC from PBC are uh, who is affected by these diseases. So PSC uh, affects men more frequently than women, about three men to every two women affected. Compared to PBC, which is by far a, a female predominant disease with 90% of the people affected being uh, women. Uh, in PSC, there's uh, very frequently uh, ongoing inflammatory bowel disease. That's that picture over on the left of the, the pipe there that's all red and inflamed. That's somebody's colon. Uh, that's got uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, in contrast, in PBC, we don't see colitis very frequently, but we see other conditions such as Sjogren's syndrome that causes dry eyes and dry mouth. And the diagnosis of PSC is based on the abnormalities we were talking about, the sclerosing of the large bile ducts, and these are detected on a cholangiogram, or what is essentially a picture of the bile ducts. Whereas PBC is diagnosed by a blood test and the presence of uh, an anti-mitochondrial antibody. This is an an abnormal antibody that's found in the blood of people with PBC. Now, in both diseases, sometimes we do do a liver biopsy. That this is uncommon for both of these diseases. Rarely do we need to do a biopsy. But if we do do a biopsy, they often show differences with the PSC showing the, the scar around the bile ducts compared to the inflammation of the small bile ducts of PBC. Next slide. These differences between the two diseases in terms of when the diagnosis usually is made or when the disease starts and the percentage of men or women affected by the diseases, they differ most patients will present with liver test. Uh, the disease could be present in them, either PBC or PSC, although it may be more less. For an individual, it's likely that, a PB, that PBC is present in a woman and PSC in a man, we can't use that alone for the diagnosis. So essentially the diagnosis of PBC is dependent on the presence of the antimitochondrial antibody, whereas the presence of PSC is dependent on that abnormal cholangiogram, and especially if it's in the presence of inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis. Next slide. What I'm showing here uh, are a comparison between a normal cholangiogram and a cholangiogram of a patient with PSC. Uh, so on the left, this is a what's called an MR cholangiogram or MRCP, and this is obtained during an MRI study. And the uh, bile ducts look like a tree. Essentially, the branches and stems are up in the liver, those intrahepatic bile ducts. And you can see there's a nice smooth tapering of the bile ducts as they go further out from the trunk of the tree. And the trunk is the common bile duct that comes down out of the liver and joins with the duodenum or small intestine where bile is uh, emptied into the intestine. And compare that over to the right to the primary sclerosing cholangitis cholangiogram, and you can see where the arrows are, these areas of narrowing of the bile ducts. And as you look further up in the tree, the branches get thicker, and that's essentially a bile duct that is then dilated because the bile can't get out. Um, and this is pretty classic of, of PSC and what we're looking for in making the diagnosis. Next slide. As I mentioned, liver biopsy is rarely done in PSC. Um, it's not very helpful for us in terms of the diagnosis, except in very uh, specific situations. Uh, if it is done, usually we'll get a finding that is compatible with PSC, but there's not really a diagnostic feature of PSC. And those that are classically found in PSC, or what we think of as classically in PSC, are actually found in a very small percentage of patients. So the image here is the, what we consider the classic 
uh, so-called onion skinning, the, the layers of scar tissue surrounding that central tube, which is the bile duct. And so this is what we'd hope to see in a biopsy of a patient with PSC, but we don't find it in most patients. And in fact, we can see it in patients without PSC, so it's not specific. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, what I've been talking about so far is what we consider the classic or large duct PSC, but there are several other types of PSC or subgroups that um, we think about when we talk about PSC. Probably the most common one is small duct PSC, and this is a group of patients that look like they have PSC and that they have abnormal liver tests. They usually have inflammatory bowel disease. But when we do the MRCP or cholangiogram, it looks normal. And then we go on to do a liver biopsy and it looks typical of PSC. And so this group of patients we call small duct PSC. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, they have a, a different uh, natural history or prognosis. There's also uh, a group of patients that are diagnosed with PSC in childhood. And they often have features of PSC that are more inflammatory, more like uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, and there's questions about whether they behave differently. I think most of the data suggests that overall the prognosis is very similar uh, to adults diagnosed with PSC, but there's still some uh, questions about that. And there are other small other groups uh, of uh, PSC uh, as well. Uh, particularly those that might have overlap of autoimmune features in adults. Uh, again, this group is not well-defined, and this impact on overall uh, behavior of PSC is not clear. Next slide. Another group of patients uh, with PSC uh, that's not been well-studied uh, are African-Americans. We've uh, found that uh, PSC is present in African-Americans at about the same rate as it's seen in, in whites in the uh, United States. So if you live in areas such as Detroit or Philadelphia, you'll see uh, a very similar percentage of uh, PSE patients uh, in the clinic as uh, are in the population. And it's relatively common as opposed to areas such as Washington State where uh, the population, there's, there's not a large number of African-Americans, so there's not a lot of PS, African-Americans with PSC. Over on the right, and I apologize, this did not translate too well to this format, there are some differences uh, in PSC among African Americans. Uh, first is that there's a lower rate of inflammatory bowel disease uh, in African Americans with PSC. It's still very common in most patients, most African Americans with PSC do have inflammatory bowel disease. There's just a small, a, a larger percentage that, that don't have it. Uh, and then the other notable uh, finding has been that there's no male predominance uh, in PSC among African Americans. It's pretty much 50-50 in terms of those affected. Next slide. Well, once the diagnosis of um, PSC is made, uh, the question is what are the expected outcomes from this disease? And 20 years ago, uh, it was pretty grim in terms of what we thought uh, the, the average survival was without liver transplantation. And while we haven't developed any new therapies, it's become clear that there's a real spectrum uh, of progression of this disease. And what this slide shows here is uh, a survival curve uh, of two different groups of patients. So along the, the horizontal axis, that's the amount of time in years from the diagnosis of PB, PSC, excuse me, from uh, the diagnosis to either liver transplantation or death from PSC. And then on the vertical uh, axis, that is the percent of the group that's still alive. And as you can see in the gray slope, after about 13 years, half of the group of patients uh, has either had a liver transplant or died of their PSC. Now that's a group of patients that were followed at a liver transplant center. And that's what previously had been reported was that about half the patients will uh, need a liver transplantation after about 
uh, 13 years. But if you look at the black line, that's the group of patients in the total population. So this includes patients that aren't at liver transplant centers, likely not referred there because they're not that sick. And you see that about half of them are still alive without a liver transplant after over 20 years. And so it's quite clear there's a group of PSE patients that really don't progress, or if they do progress, they progress very slowly. Uh, and this is something that's, I think, quite interesting in, in trying to determine which group an individual patient is in uh, is, a, is a challenge, but uh, I think uh, it's important for uh, understanding where an individual patient is along that curve. Next slide. So when we have a patient clinic with PSC, there are really three areas that we need to be aware of and thinking of. Uh, the first two are related to the liver, and the, the third one is, has to do with the colon. So like all liver diseases, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, any kind of liver disease, PSE can progress to cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease, be complicated by all the uh, complications of cirrhosis, such as ascites, variceal bleeding, and encephalopathy. In addition, though, we have to be concerned about bile duct cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, which can occur in a small fraction of patients, as well as infections of the bile ducts or bacterial cholangitis and development of jaundice, not due to cirrhosis, but due to obstruction of the bile duct. And then related to the colon, we have to be aware that patients with PSC and inflammatory bowel disease are at high risk of developing colon cancer as well as needing colectomy due to refractory colitis, just like other patients with ulcerative colitis. Next slide. So one way to monitor our, uh, the progression of cirrhosis in PSC is with uh, non-invasive methods rather than liver biopsies, such as fiber scan or shear wave or MR elastography. These are all technologies that allow us to measure the liver stiffness, which generally correlates to the uh, amount of fibrosis in the liver. And like other diseases, its best value is really in differentiating individuals in the early stages of disease versus the later stages of the disease. And you can see on the right-hand side, the progression of uh, the liver stiffness or fibrosis is not linear, it's not a straight line, and be very flat in the early stages. But as the uh, fibrosis or scarring progresses, it increases much more rapidly. And so it's quite helpful to uh, uh, determine or stage a patient between the earlier and later stages and help uh, understand what the short and medium term prognosis are. Next slide. Also uh, important to recognize that there are several factors, none of which we necessarily can change, that uh, have been associated with uh, outcomes of PSC. Women do tend to do better than men. Individuals uh, diagnosed at a younger age tend to do better than those diagnosed at an older age. Uh, African Americans appear to uh, have a more aggressive disease than whites. Individuals with Crohn's disease as opposed to uh, ulcerative colitis uh, tend to do better. And as I mentioned, small duct PSC, those individuals actually do better than those with large duct PSC. And individuals with PSE who have a normal alkaline phosphatase also do better. Uh, whether this represents just being earlier in the disease course or, or something very specific about having a normal alkaline phosphatase is not, not clear. Next slide. So what are the treatment to try to fibrosis? There are no proven therapies. Um, the best studies have been ursodiol, ursodeoxycholic acid, or Actigal, or some of the names used. And it's been studied in the US and Scandinavia, and it really has not been shown to be effective in, in those two uh, relatively large long-term studies. Next slide. Now, it's been safe at the, but it's important to recognize that at very high doses, I don't think anyone's using these high doses anymore, it's very, it was found to be um, actually not uh, detrimental, I should say. It was found to be detrimental to the group of patients that were given URSO compared to placebo. So if the decision is to use URSO, we want to be sure that we're just using it at routine doses. Next slide. Now, the, the confounder here is that 
Urso does improve alkaline phosphatase. And as I mentioned, alkaline phosphatase, when it's normal, uh, is associated uh, with better outcomes. But as shown here, this is uh, from a study of the use of ursodiol, in which patients that had a normal alkaline phosphatase, regardless of whether they got urso or not, did better than those that did not have uh, a normal uh, alkaline phosphatase. So it's not clear that the urso is actually giving any benefit. Uh, I think advance forward. Next slide. Now, probably the most controversial area of treatment in PST is oral vancomycin. And there's clearly a lot of interest, both from patients uh, as well as investigators, and the potential benefits of vancomycin. This first came out from uh, a case series of uh, pediatric patients with PSC treated at Stanford University, uh, in which there seemed to be a real improvement uh, in their, their uh, uh, clinical status with the use of vancomycin. This has been followed by a, a trial, a very small short-term trial at the Mayo Clinic showing some improvement in alkaline phosphatase. But currently in the published literature, there's only a report of 96 patients um, treated for generally short periods of time with oral vancomycin. Uh, and so at this time, at least in my opinion, I don't believe that oral vancomycin is something we'd want to try outside of a clinical trial for the treatment of PSC. There are, however, uh, one if not two planned clinical trials of oral vancomycin. Um, and so hopefully we'll have more uh, data to uh, either uh, establish this as a, a therapy or, or, or understand its uh, potential efficacy and safety. Next slide. So uh, for me, uh, in terms of approach to uh, PSC treatment with ursodiol, I think the slide might have gotten uh, uh, formatted incorrectly here. I apologize. Uh, if the decision is to use ursodiol, it should be used uh, at less than 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, and if the alkaline phosphatase improves after about six months, it's reasonable to continue it. If it doesn't improve uh, or a patient does not wish to be on alkaline phosphatase, then consideration of clinical trials is always there. There currently are a few clinical trials uh, uh, either on going in the near future. So uh, there should be lots of opportunities for that. Next slide. So just to wrap up the last couple of slides in terms of other management issues, um, in terms of cholangiocarcinoma, just would uh, recommend that uh, surveillance uh, be considered because uh, it is potentially uh, treatable at early stages. Uh, probably doesn't need surveillance in children or those with small buck because the risk is so small. Uh, also, we should have a very low threshold for investigating cholangiocarcinoma if there's any change in symptoms or uh, changes in liver biochemistries. Uh, patients should be aware of the signs and symptoms of cholangitis or infection of the bile ducts. That typically is going to be the right upper quadrant pain and fever and may have jaundice. Uh, any of those symptoms should be reported to the physician immediately and um, with potentially starting antibiotics early before severe sepsis. Uh, occurs. So uh, definitely an important sign uh, to be aware of. Next slide. Uh, and finally, colon cancer is really important for those patients that have PSC. Uh, patients with ulcerative colitis already have a risk of colon cancer, and PSC actually amplifies that risk. So it's recommended that annual colonoscopy be performed in all patients with PSC and IBD. However, if you don't have IBD and just PSC, there's really no need for increased surveillance to our knowledge. Uh, in terms of colitis, it can be treated just like any other form of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Next slide. So just to summarize, uh, diagnosis of PSC can be difficult in atypical cases. Uh, and I think it's important for patients to understand the differences between both PSC and PPC uh, because these are rare conditions, and uh, in the atypical case, it might be difficult for uh, uh, a, a general uh, physician to differentiate them. Uh, currently, there are no treatments uh, that have proven to be effective for PSC. Uh, and there, fortunately, are several clinical trials uh, ongoing or planned, and so we're very hopeful that in the near future, we will have some effective therapies. 
uh, and this uh, provides opportunities for clinical trial participation. Uh, and in addition to looking for new treatments, the management of PSE really requires surveillance for cancers that include the cholangiocarcinoma, colon cancer, and something I haven't mentioned is gallbladder cancer as well. Uh, so thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure to be here. I look forward to answering questions. Thanks very much, Dr. Bolas. So uh, to remind you, please uh, type any questions you have in the question box, and we'll get to them at the end. So I'm going to talk, this is Marion Peters. I'm going to talk about autoimmune hepatitis and pregnancy. Next slide. The key issues are really, keep just pulling them through. Counseling on pregnancy and patients really depend on how autoimmune hepatitis affects pregnancy, the safety of medications in the pregnant woman, and then the impact of the pregnancy on the course of the autoimmune hepatitis, and how you adjust treatment in pregnancy and in the postpartum period. I think the most important takeaway message is that the control of autoimmune hepatitis is the most important issue for the success of a pregnancy. Next slide. So what's the impact of autoimmune hepatitis on pregnancy? Women, when they're first diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, may have amenorrhea and no, no periods. But usually with treatment, they come back and have relatively normal periods. Fertility improves with autoimmune hepatitis therapy, and the majority of women are actually in biochemical remission when they conceive. Fertility is decreased in cirrhosis, and a big study in uh, California showed that in nearly 6,000 pregnancies, per 6,000 pregnancies, there was one cirrhotic, so it's not very common. But in vitro fertilization has been utilized in women with autoimmune hepatitis. Fetal growth is also affected and obstetric complications. So we'll see that on the next slide. There are lower fetal outcomes in about 70 to 80 percent. It's difficult to say whether autoimmune hepatitis affects first trimester abortions because most of the studies are retrospective and many women will have irregular menses and won't know if they had a miscarriage. But it is clear that there are lower, the, the babies are smaller, um, lower live birth rates. They're similar to other autoimmune diseases that there is a decreased risk of success in pregnancy. And what is most important is that the outcome for the baby is not adversely affected by therapy for the mother. There's a higher premature birth rate. And this has changed with time. I think as we have, as physicians have gotten better at treating patients and decreasing uh, therapies and getting patients into remission faster. In the 70s and 80s, it was about 30%. But in the last two decades, the reported uh, premature birth rate has only ranged from 6 to 20%. There's been no increase in fetal abnormalities. I, as uh, Dr. Yimam said, that cirrhosis can be very common. Could you just put, run all the slides on this one? And so there's lower live birth rates. Neonates are more likely to be premature and admitted to a neonatal intensive care unit if the mother has cirrhosis. There's also an increased pregnancy risk associated with poor disease control prior to conception. So my first slide said the most important thing is to, to be in remission before you conceive because if you don't have good control of your autoimmune hepatitis, the patient will have a bad outcome and the baby may have a bad outcome. There's an increased pregnancy risk if the mother is not on any therapy or even if they're diagnosed while they're pregnant and there's an increased pregnancy risk if the mother has cirrhosis. 
or is older, which is true of all pregnancies. What about safety of medications? Azathioprine is the most commonly used drug for women in remission. At very high doses, we usually use around one milligram per kilogram, like 50 or 75 milligrams a day, and you drop it even lower if a patient's in remission. So at very high doses, five milligrams per kilogram, it caused fetal abnormalities in animals. So there is a potential toxicity in humans, and the FDA r reports that it can cause fetal harm and shouldn't be given without carefully weighing the risk benefits. So let me give you some of that data. There's only retrospective data in women in pregnancy. Azathioprine does cross the placenta and azathioprine therapy is associated with lower adverse outcomes in autoimmune hepatitis women. So controlling the autoimmune hepatitis, even using azathioprine, is better than women who aren't on azathioprine. But there are studies in liver transplant recipients and kidney transplant recipients and patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So this is not autoimmune. And these studies have shown higher preterm birth, but that was not shown in autoimmune hepatitis. The problem with azathioprine is it's often stopped by the patient or by the physician when it's, as I said earlier, it's used in more than half of pregnant women with autoimmune hepatitis. So if you stop the azathioprine, patients can flare and that has a dangerous adverse outcome. And studies looking at fetal outcomes or fetal abnormalities showed worse fetal outcomes in patients on no azathioprine compared to those who are on treatment, confirming yet again that control of the disease is more important than the use of azathioprine. There's no difference in live birth rates, in the rate of termination or the length of uh, the pregnancy. There's higher incidence of flares in women not on therapy, which is a real concern if the patient or the ph physician stops therapy. So control of autoimmune is really more important than a potential toxicity. Breastfeeding is not recommended by the package insert and many patients with liver disease, breastfeeding is not recommended for their medication. But 6-MP levels, as Dr. Uh, Yaman said, is the metabolite of azathioprine they're very low or undetectable in breast milk samples. So it is considered safe and is recommended for patients with ulcerative colitis and is usually recommended by, by most OBs for patients with autoimmune hepatitis. So in contradistinction, Celsept or mycophenolate mofetil should not be used in pregnancy because it's associated with a higher risk of first trimester miscarriage and an increased risk of congenital malformations. So it is very important if your patient is on or if you are on uh, Celsept that you stop it before conceiving. Prednisone doesn't have a category and the FDA says use the lowest dose possible. At higher doses, it's associated with an increase in premature birth and low birth weight infants. And there's a threefold increase in the risk of cleft palate after maternal exposure to steroids in the first trimester in a large meta-analysis, but they were mostly higher doses of prednisone in a retrospect, in a prospective analysis of 180 women on prednisone versus the same number of pregnant controls, there was no increased risk. But it is a concern at high dose, and there's very limited data on budesonide because it's only been available in the last decade. Normally in pregnancy, many of the tests change. So serum albumin decreases, bilirubin decreases, and it hemoglobin decreases because you increase the blood volume and alkaline phosphatase increases because of the growing bones in the baby. 
but there's no change in AST or ALT, no change in platelet count. So next slide, please. What about the effect of pregnancy on the course of autoimmune? Pregnancy can occur for the first time in a pregnant woman, including very severe presentation. Flares can occur in pregnancy and they occur at a rate of about two to 21%. Even in women who had sustained remission when they became pregnant, they're more likely to be associated with the liver stopping to work. And flares occur after the baby is delivered, postpartum period, way more frequently, 22 to 52%. So it's very critical to monitor patients very closely during pregnancy and postpartum. There's a higher cesarean rate in cirrhotic women, but it's not clear if that's the obstetrician choosing to do that because of theoretical risk of decreasing bleeding from esophageal varices. But it actually may be worse because you give patient an anesthetic so they're at risk of um, postoperative decompensation. The impact of pregnancy on the course of autoimmune hepatitis, cirrhotic patients have a higher rate of liver failing, worsening of uh, portal hypertensive events that's bleeding from esophageal varices or ascites or fluid in the abdomen. Propranolol is not contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, there's higher serious maternal adverse event in cirrhotic women, either death or transplant occurring in about 10%. And they, you, the pe women who are at most risk are those who's meld or model for end-stage liver disease. That's how yellow the patient is, how bad the clotting is, and um, how good the kidneys are. Those who are at, have the worst meld are more likely to have significant events such as bleeding or ascites or encephalopathy. And I already mentioned that the highest cesarean rate, it's not clear whether that's uh, physician selected. And it's certainly not clear that it decreases the risk of bleeding. So you need to adjust treatment during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Because flares are common, careful monitoring is required. And during pregnancy should be every four to six weeks, postpartum every four to six weeks for the first three to six months. What I will say, there are no studies to validate this. And if a patient is in remission and looks very stable, you can perhaps extend it a bit longer. But the reason you do it frequently is so you can rapidly restart therapy or increase therapy during or after pregnancy. Manage the patient just as the same as you do a non-pregnant patient. Some experts still recommend pregnancy, prednisone alone, but over 50% use azathioprine, and I've shown you data that it appears to be safe. So how do you counsel the patient? Good preconception autoimmune control. If the patient, if you are of childbearing age, then the first time you meet them, you remind them about normal ALT, normal IgG. So normal ALT for women is 20 and IgG should be low normal. That's the best outcome. And I like to aim for a year of autoimmune control before conception as an ideal and have a detailed discussion with the patient of the risk and benefits of each medication during pregnancy and best breastfeeding. Tell them they should not be on CELSEP. They can't, they have to switch off before they get pregnant. And if a patient is cirro has cirrhosis, it's very important they understand the risks of pregnancy to themselves and the baby. Azathioprine and prednisone has not been shown to have an adverse effect on pregnancy outcome, and it is ideal to optimize autoimmune control. Flares do occur and require addition or increase in prednisone. Biopsies are rarely needed. And breastfeeding can be continued while on azathioprine and prednisone. So in summary, autoimmune 
hepatitis is associated with a higher risk to the baby, but better control improve, decreases that risk. And the control with azathioprine and prednisone of the mother way outweighs the potential harmful effects of the drugs on the fetus. Cirrhosis does have increased fetal and maternal adverse effects and should only be done when managed by a team of a hepatologist, an endoscopist, and an obstetrician. Close monitoring is required during pregnancy and in the postpartum period, and flares should be treated very promptly. The patients have to commit to spending a significant amount of time going and getting their labs drawn. Thank you very much. So um, if if both Dr. Bolus and Dr. Yimam can turn on their phones, that would be great. Um, let's get started. Um, what, Dr. Yimam, why would you choose budesonide over prednisone? I know you talked a little uh, bit about it. Sure. So like I stated, budesonide is a type of steroid, which is... Um, metabolized um, fast by the liver. Um, as a result, they have low um, systemic exposure of steroids. So by using bidesonide, you are certainly minimizing steroid-related side effects, um, which I listed um, earlier. Um, worsening of diabetes, weight gain, um, psychiatric manifestations, osteoporosis, osteopenia, um, so, bidesonide will certainly have a better safety profile compared to prednisone, which will have a higher level of steroid systemic exposure. And do you start budesonide or do you always start with prednisone? So, I usually go by the degree of um, the degree or the activity of the autoimmune hepatitis, i.e., degree of elevation and transaminases or IgG or degree of inflammation on, on liver. If patients have a very active severe disease, I usually start with, um, personally start with pertinazone and I may, um, you know, I will add azathioprine and see if in the long term I maintain them on um, azathioprine only. If steroid will be needed, I may introduce budesonide later. Um, on the other hand, if you have patients with milder activity, uh, meaning um, AST and LT not too elevated with moderately elevated IgG, um, I may start with bedesonide in that case. Okay. Okay. Dr. Bolas, when do you do ER MRCP versus ERCP in follow-up? Should... Should the patient be asking their doctor for one or the other? Uh, that's a really good and difficult question. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so um, th this is quite variable from practice to practice. In the setting of diagnosis, uh, a new patient where we're suspecting PSC, uh, an MRI or MRCP is adequate in the great majority of patients. In some patients, though, we can't get a good MRI or the suspicion is still high and we want to really be sure uh, that this is PSE. So we might get an ERCP in those, those cases, though it, it's relatively uncommon nowadays, but ERCP remains sort of the diagnostic gold standard. Once we've made a diagnosis of PSC, we generally uh, try to avoid doing ERCPs because it does introduce uh, bacteria into the bile ducts and can uh, cause further problems. Um, and there's some risk with ERCP as well in terms of complications, though it's a relatively safe procedure. When we do do an ERCP, it's because there's some specific change, um, usually development of, of jaundice, worsening liver tests, new symptoms of cholangitis, where we are looking to determine what the cause of that change is. Is it a benign stricture that can be dilated uh, and treated to reopen the large bile duct, or do we have to be concerned that it could be development of a cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer 
and the ERCP allows us to do um, sampling there. In the absence of those changes, then my practice has been to get an MRI annually, at least in those patients you know, that uh, appeared to have some risk for cholangiocarcinoma, and we use that as a, a, a surveillance test for that. Um, though other imaging, such as ultrasound, may be just as good, it's not clear. And what about blood tests for looking for cancer? Do you think they're valuable in PSC? Uh, so in the absence of cirrhosis, um, there, there is still a risk of cholangiocarcinoma, and there's some suggestion that CA199, the tumor marker for bile duct cancers, would be helpful. And again, in my practice, I do get that tumor marker, um, but I have to say it's quite difficult to interpret. Uh, there's a portion of the population that just doesn't produce it, so we won't see it elevated when there is cancer. And we also know that it becomes elevated when there's obstruction of the bile ducts, and so it can be elevated even in the absence of cancer. Uh, but lacking any other better test, I've been getting it. Um, liver, uh, typical liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, can occur in PSC in the presence of cirrhosis, though at a very low rate. Um, the general recommendations are to go ahead and screen those individuals. Uh, and uh, I'll let you answer whether we should be doing AFP screening uh, in patients with cirrhosis, um, since that's also, I think, uh, a controversial area. Yeah, I think we should do AFP, alpha feta protein, a blood test with the six monthly ultrasounds in patients mm -hmm. who have cirrhosis, even though. AFP is often elevated with inflammation, but if your patient has autoimmune disease or PSC and the AST ALT is not high, it usually isn't high. But in patients with Hep C, the alpha feta protein will be elevated with no cancer in 30% and will be normal with cancer in 30%. So it's not a great test. But it's a good test if you have cancer, you can treat the cancer and watch the AFP come down. So it's a useful marker in that respect. Yeah. But cancer Agreed. isn't as common in autoimmune as it is in uh, viral hepatitis. Mm -hmm. But as Dr. Agreed. Yimam said, it does occur. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Yimam, what about vaccination? What do you tell your patients to be vaccinated to and not to be vaccinated to? Um, you know, every, um, everybody with autoimmune liver disease or in general liver diseases uh, should, we need to make sure that they are immune or if not vaccinated for hepatitis um, A and B. Um, additionally, they should get yearly influenza vaccine. Um, there is uh, the newly approved uh, Zoster vaccine uh, which can be taken in patients with immunosuppression, but I think uh, from my last reading, um, it is acceptable for patients that ha that are on mild to moderate level of immunosuppression, but um, those with higher doses of prednisone or additional immunosuppressive agents, um, since that group has not been evaluated, I don't think it's recommended still for those that are on higher doses of immunosuppression. Yes, because um, our, our of, transplant patients, we give them the new Zoster vaccine. You know, the other uh, point to bring up is the timing of right other vaccinations and whether or not they would be able to Im mount immunity um, to it. Um, when do you usually offer for those uh, that are on high doses of immuno immunosuppression? Do you wait till they are on lower dose of immunosuppression or do you do it prior to transplant? So we do it immediately on the, because if it works, great, and you don't forget to do it. But if it doesn't work, then we redo it when they're on less immunosuppression. What do you do, Dr. Bolas? Um, I send them elsewhere since we don't do liver transplant. <laughs> <laughs> Do you vaccinate your them when you see them? 
Um, yeah, I, I, I generally will vaccinate uh, the patients. Uh. Right. So uh, what about IgG4 PSC? Is it a different disease or different treatment? Yeah, so IgG4 is a, a interesting uh, phenomenon in that we do see a separate entity of IgG4 sclerosing cholangitis that can look like PSC but is not. It's responsive to steroids, generally doesn't have inflammatory bowel disease, and it's a completely different entity but does have these same changes to the bile ducts. The, um, within the patients that clearly have PSC, there is a group, probably 10, maybe 20% at most, that have elevated IgG4 levels. My own experience is it's even lower than 10%. Um, there was initial, uh, initially a study suggesting that they had more severe disease, more uh, poor outcome. Uh, that's since uh, not been seen, uh, hasn't been shown to be the case, uh, particularly in, in a very well done clinical trial. Uh, IgG4 was not associated with any difference in outcomes or disease stage or anything else. So I think there may be a subgroup of patients with high IgG4. I think it may just indicate some stage of disease, but I don't think there's a lot to to be gained by um, treating those patients any differently. Okay. Dr. Yimam, what do you tell your patients on azathioprine? in terms of education and monitoring? Um, so in terms of education, so, you know, we usually go over some of the common side effects of azathioprine, uh, which can include nausea, vomiting, a rare um, incidence of pancreatitis. Um, again, if the level of uh, 6 MMP, which is one of the metabolites of um, is that high pain if that's high, you also can get hepatotoxicity. There is generally increased susceptibility to infection to anyone who's immunosuppressed. Um, we also go over uh, a small but slightly increased risk of, you know, nanogenic lymphoma, and particularly there is increased the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, therefore, I usually educate our patients that they need to. Uh, adopt um, a uh, kind of protective uh, method, having hats when they're out exposed in the sun, applying sunscreen lotion, and more importantly, I usually advise uh, patients that they should get a good thorough dermatologic um, skin exam or in, um, skin inspection at least yearly or frequently um, if needed. Oh, I did okay. You can also get marrow, bone marrow suppression causing uh, leukopenia or decreased white count, and that's one of the rationales that we have to monitor their complete blood count um, in keeping um, the drug or the 60G metabolite level within that window that we discussed, which is like 230 to 400 range. Okay, and I'm going to tackle um, what about fat-soluble vitamins? So patients with cholestatic liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis, PSC, PBC, should have a baseline bone density. If it's abnormal, um, that needs to be monitored very closely. They should have 25-hydroxy vitamin D test and tested, and if it's low, they should be supplemented. It's an important point because many people in the Bay Area are vitamin D deficient and don't know it. So I test all my liver patients and I make sure they take adequate vitamin D and calcium. If they don't respond uh, with normal vitamin D replacement, they may need a special form of vitamin D, 125 hydroxy vitamin D and use that. And if they have poor bone density, I will uh, refer them to um, endocrine for other therapies. Do either of you screen for hep B or TB in your patients? Uh, I mean, Yaman, for 
answer. Um, you know, there are a few things that I usually check before initiating uh, immunosuppression in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. One of them is a screening for latent TB um, and a screening for chronic hepatitis B infection or prior exposure. Um, because um, there is a risk of reactivating um, if patients are placed on immunosuppressions, particularly higher doses. Um, so pa patient with, patients with latent TB, I often refer them to infectious disease to be treated, but the challenge um, in that scenario, particularly if they are they have significant, uh, significantly elevated liver enzymes is that some of the medications used to treat um, hepatitis or there is a risk of uh, drug-induced liver injury. I may wait till their autoimmune hepatitis is a bit controlled and then tackle the latent TB. For those with certainly chronic hepatitis B infection, meaning if they have surface antigen positivity or if they have HPV DNA detectable, they need to be on antiviral therapy. Um, and in terms of using um, hep B treatment uh, for prophylaxis for those that have just core antibody positivity, uh, meaning prior exposure but no active infection or chronic infection, is that I tend to use um, antiviral therapy if they are on, if they're going to be on higher doses of immunosuppression. I think the risk of using the drug is minimal um, compared to potentially reactivating Hep B. Um, what What do you do? Do you treat everyone with core antibody positivity? No. Uh, only if they're getting rituximab or stem cell transplant or organ transplant. Dr. No, Bolus, mm -hmm. what yeah, do you do? Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, you know, all these patients get hepatitis B testing as just part of their evaluation. So, and I, I can't say I've run into that scenario where I'm doing using immunosuppression outside of transplant or some other auto, you know, but in hep autoimmune hepatitis, I've not needed that. Um, and I haven't been uh, checking for latent TB, I have to say. Um, I'm not sure what Neither the risk of, way. of reactivation is with the typical azathioprednisone. If I was using biologics, it would be a different story. Um, but right. I don't know if there were reports of that. So I've not been doing that as a general practice. And I think you run into the problems, as uh, Dr. Mom mentioned. Uh, how do you deal with the prophylactic therapy of... Uh, TB in that setting? I have had a few people that I did not treat because of that fear, and you know, none of them, I would say just two though, did not have um, reactivation of TB. <clears throat> so it, it would be nice to know the actual rate. One thing I was going to comment is, Marianne, there, is, there was a newer AG, um, I think, paper well, on the, the AGA the, had a yeah. different a different opinion to all the other guidelines. So I, I think talk to your doctor is the answer. But now we have to close. Thank you so much to both of you for really lovely presentations. And I'll turn it over to Veronica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Peters and Dr. Bolas and Dr. Imam for an incredible webinar. Um, I would like to thank everyone who uh, registered and attended our um, first 2019 webinar. This last page has all different kinds of resources listed on our American Liver Foundation website. And um, you can also access this webinar recording again. So thank you so much.